Thank you, Dr. Badgers, for the um, presentation. Uh, now we can uh, move on to our um, uh, panel discussion for the uh, first two sessions for this morning. Uh, in addition to the uh, speakers um, uh, present in this morning, we will have two more uh, panelists uh, joining the discussion as well. Uh, the first one is uh, Mr. Brian Debar. Uh, uh, Mr. Debar is a senior manager in the skin biology, global pharmacology, and toxicology department of Wilchis. And we also have uh, Dr. Ripen Misri from Apotex. Dr. Misri is currently director of co-development R&D, leading development of complex generic drug and drug device combination products. I would like to uh, have a uh, all our panelists uh, have your camera turned on. Thank you. So yeah, um, we we have uh, received a lot of um, uh, audience questions uh, from the sessions in this mornings. Maybe we can uh, start with some of the questions. Um, I think the first question uh, we got is, uh, is it? Require for method adopted from uh, official compendio or uh, FDA database to demonstrate discriminative power. So uh, I think for this question, maybe I can first provide my perspective. Um, uh, yeah. So usually, the um, even if you choose a, a official compendio uh, IVIT method or the methods in the US FDA database, um, that just serve as a starting point. Uh, you still need to uh, validate the methods to show it's uh, uh, appropriate for the intended use. And of course, you also need to demonstrate the discriminative power. Uh, that's my perspective. Um, I would like to see if our industry uh, panelists have uh, uh, any additional input. Uh, Dr. 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 Misri, do you have any? Um, Comments to this question? Uh, I, I am in agreement uh, with what you just said. Uh, I think it, it's important to demonstrate the discriminatory ability regardless of what the source of the method is, uh, because the purpose is really to be able to say that the method is able to discriminate uh, against the critical quality attributes of the product. Thank you, Dr. Misri. Um, for next question um, we got is, uh, is it necessary that we develop a fast uh, release IVRT method for ophthalmic products? How much should be the dissolution of volume recommended? Uh, I think I can also uh, quickly provide some, uh, 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 some comments uh, from my perspective for this question. Um, I think dissolution medium uh, it's uh, how much volume you use. Uh, you, you should be uh, uh, investigating this in your, uh, during the development of your IVIT methods. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the early uh, uh, session in the presentations, uh, uh, really uh, you need to provide uh, like sufficient information to show to FDA uh, why those uh, parameters you selected as the optimum uh, test. So I think the solution uh, volume is definitely one of uh, a very important parameters. Uh, you should uh, pay attention to in your IVIT development. Uh, here, I, I want to see if our other panel members have any uh, input for this question. Um, Uh, I would just like to add uh, the dissolution volume that you would use uh, will, will typically depend on what kind of product you have and what is the in vivo application. Is it an ophthalmic? Is it an uh, injectable, uh, which is injected uh, intravenously, or is it an intramuscular product? So that will dictate what kind of release you're expecting and what kind of volume you would need to choose for to demonstrate that release. So it, it uh, need not be a fixed amount, but the important thing is for you to be able to investigate and justify the volume 
that has been used for, for IVRD. So in, in one of the, the most key thing is the solubility of the drug and to ensure that you're at the sink conditions. And there's some people define the sink condition as about three times the solubility, but in my opinion, it needs to be much higher, particularly if you're using apparatus four, because the, the flow through cell only sees a small volume of your fluid at any given time. So I have found that for apparatus four, you need to be closer to 10 times for the same condition. Thank you for the input. Um, uh, for our next question, um, uh, I think this question uh, is to uh, Mark. Um, the audience asked if, you were to use an IVRT methods uh, from FDA dissolution database to prove the discriminative power. How in depth does development need to go? Will the lab scale discrimination studies sufficient? Or does this need to be done at commercial scale levels for approval of the products? Sorry, I'm <coughs> having trouble with the with the video, I don't know if you can you can hear me. Um, I didn't I didn't catch the middle of it, but I, that question was: if you take an FDA dissolution database method, when must the discriminatory dissolution be shown? Is that yeah? The the, the question is: uh, if you use a uh, um, the dissolution methods from FDA dissolution database. Um, uh, to prove the discriminative power, uh, how in depth uh, a study you need to do? Uh, can you use lab scale uh, discrimination studies? Is this sufficient, or you, you need to use commercial scale levels? For the, for the product? That really that'll come down to your risk assessments and whether the the project team agree or disagree whether there's a, a risk of a change to the product on scaling up from the lab scale to the commercial scale. Historically, we've done a lot of that work on, on lab scale, but on the condition that the, the, the risk assessment is done on the, on the scale, up, provided the, the initial registration or initial scale up PV batches meet the expected profile, it's probably low risk, but it just all needs to be taken into account. So, I mean, so much of what we do now in the industry is based around these these risk assessments and justifying not performing testing based on on that risk evaluation. So, it's not a it's not a short answer, but it depends whether whether you think there's a risk or not when you scale up. Um, I would like to add uh, to the point uh, Dr. Howlett said that uh, whatever uh, scale that we that um, plan to be used for discriminatory for discriminatory ability of the IBRD method, the manufacturing process um, and other parameters used to, to manufacture the batch the batch for the um, IBR for the discriminatory ability. This manufacturing parameter should be reflective of those to be used for the commercial uh, scale, so that we can uh, um, evaluate that the acceptability of the um, IBRT method itself. And that is always also mentioned in the um, product specific guidance for ophthalmic commercial products. Thank you. Um, I would like to see uh, whether uh, uh, Mr. Brian Dabar, um, do you have any additional input for this question from industry perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with, with all the points on this. Um, it depends on your risk assessment and, and how robust your lab scale process is. It's often difficult to get all of the proper parameters or do a full evaluation on a commercial scale. So a lot of that is generally done in the development process. And if there's 
something that's identified as high risk or extremely important to the validation moving forward, um, that can obviously be moved to a commercial scale. But I think in general, a lot can be done in the, the laboratory size of the development batches. Thank you. Uh, the next question is um, for long acting injections, can we use non compendial uh, dissolution apparatus? For instance, a bottle rotating apparatus for, uh, for IVRT? So I can. I can answer that first if you like. So people do use non-compendial apparatus, but I wouldn't recommend it because the, with the compendial apparatus, you can have much better control and you can get um, inter, you can change your apparatus to a different site, a different commercial site or a different manufacturing site. And you're going to be able to have the confidence that you're using you know, the compendial apparatus where if you're just doing like a bottle shaker in a water bath or something, then there's no like standardization of that. So you could end up getting um, different data between different sites. So I wouldn't recommend it, although I know that that it is done. Um, I, I myself sometimes use these non-compendial methods. For example, we have a, a project right now where we're doing release testing over extremely long time of five to 10 years. And there, this, some of these small nuances are not going to have such, such an effect. But with something that is releasing over a relatively short time, and a lot of the, 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 the release tests that are done um, till now are, as I said, over just hours to a couple of days. So I would definitely not. I would definitely not recommend it, recommend using non compendial for these kind of short time release profiles. But I think it would be good to hear the FDA perspective on that. Yeah, I, I would like to see uh, whether Doctor. Uh, Kapana Pandyu has any uh, uh, comments for this question? Uh, well, uh, for many doses forms, like uh, um, like today I presented intravaginal rings. Um, we do not have much of compendial type of uh, you know apparatus. So in such a type of doses forms, I think uh, we, I mean, Whatever is available or whatever the applicant um, you know, can use is fine. But the main problem point is that, um, you know, again, the full justification of the method, whatever is chosen, uh, should be provided and um, discriminating ability should be demonstrated. So. So it is not that like we cannot use like non-compendial when it's not available, but of course, like for solid doses forms and other formulations where the compendial methods are there, uh, then if the non-compendial method is being used, then justification, strong justification should be provided that why it is being used instead of the compendial uh, apparatus. Thank you. Um, for, for the next question, um, I think this question uh, is to Dr. Burgess. How can you uh, reduce variability utilizing apparatus for methods, uh, specifically for polymer products? So the, the data that I presented, we had very low variability with apparatus four, and this is quite typical of apparatus four. It's a very controlled system. It's, it's very well designed. And so you're, you're not gonna have those, those like um, small variations that you can particularly get with apparatus two. So even as it being a compendial method, there can be um, like, and the data I was showing was it's because of the adapter and some of the nuances with the adapter and how you fit that cap on. 
and that tearing the membrane and so on, and, or just causing some, some um, air bubbles and so on is, is where the, the source of the variation is coming there. But with Appar Apparatus 4 is, is really, really well designed. And it is also was originally designed for controlled release oral solid dosage farms and is, is been really well adapted to these long acting um, dosage forms as well. So yeah, it's not so much what I'm doing there. It's just that the system is, is just really, really good for this type of um, dosage forms. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Um, I would like to see uh, if uh, anyone else uh, have any uh, additional uh, comments or input to discussions. Uh, maybe Dr. Uh, Mark, Mark Halas, do you have any? No, nothing on USP four. <clears throat> um, for the next question, um, um, uh, this question is: uh, What type of criteria do you use to determine if an IVRT method is discriminative enough? Is there a target percentage? Um, I think for this question, uh, I would like to start with maybe Dr. Park. Hi, uh, Davin. So uh, for the discrimination study, we usually uh, want to see the sensitivity of this IVIT method using the different amount of API. So you can use maybe change a little bit of API amount. So your IVIT method can detect the, if you got the wrong badges. So that's the sensitivity uh, perspective. And then the selectivity perspective, I think one of the slides Mark gave a very good summarize that uh, we can see the formulation changes, such as like an excipient chain. So for the ophthalmic uh, emulsion product, you maybe see some changes of the castor oil or some other excipient. And also the, we want to see some kind of a manufacturing process changes. So for example, the, I gave some example of the suspension product, you maybe change some uh, homogenization uh, chain steps. So we can see some little bit different uh, particle size or the other uh, parameters. So that's what I can say, the sensitivity and then selectivity is kind of a key uh, aspect you can provide the evidence to your IDRT method is discriminative. Thank you, Dr. Park. Um, so um, for the next question, um, uh, further to add for uh, IBRT studies versus the IRD, uh, most of the time uh, three lots are not available at the same time in the commercial market. So in this case, uh, can I use two lots data of the IOD versus the test product? Is this sufficient? Um, for this question, maybe uh, we can have uh, Dr. Uh, Ala Abuzanate to uh, provide some input. Um, I think the key point here is that there would be sufficient number of samples to provide the um, good reproducibility and replicate the measurement to properly evaluate the um, uh, release of a drug from the formulation. And when it comes to fewer than uh, three lahats, um, perhaps uh, this is um, mostly a kid by kid uh, basis. And the uh, best course of action here is that the applicant would reach out to the agent team with their question and proposal and possibly provide a justification that how would an IGRT study still work within less than three lots. Yeah, I can also chime in that uh, uh, Alas comment. So if you can find out the enough number of the RLD batches, you can reach out to 
FDA or by control class vendor, something like that. So the, we can maybe confirm that the, actually in the uh, RLD batch is not available on the market. And then we can give some kind of a comment or response. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the comments. Um, is there any additional comments for this question uh, from our in industry panelists? You know, coming from the background where we use more of the Fran cells for ointments, um, it is a difficult issue where there's not a lot of availability or sometimes cost prohibitive. Um, hopefully, you have time to go through and look at several lots and develop those ranges, but um, that may be a case with limited um, product. You use your lab scale batches to more or less characterize the CQAs of your own product to help develop or push those methods forward and, and lack of um, RLD availability. Thank you. We cannot hear you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I was unmute. Um, I think for the next question, uh, um, uh, can you please further elaborate the purpose of determining the mass balance? Is mass balance expected for all the time points? I think uh, maybe Dr. Parr and Dr. Abu Zane can provide some input for this question. Yeah, so I can I can start my comments about the sampling time point. Yeah, ideally we want to see the same sampling time point with the UIVIP method. So that maybe have better uh, kind of uh, understanding. Uh, but maybe you can think about it a little bit less frequent uh, sampling time point if necessary. But basically we want to see the same sampling time point. And for the mass balance study, the we maybe under, uh, have to understand the, what is the purpose of the mass balance study. So for the ophthalmic emulsion product, maybe the Allah can time in later. So we see some kind of, a, the major concern is that a membrane or the eating dialysis membrane or just any kind of a regular membrane. So if the oil global just pass through the pore size of the membrane that into the media, then it can maybe detect as this release, but that's not, that's not actually release, it is just passing through. So uh, we maybe see some cast oil amount for the um, ophthalmic immersion product in the media from the time point wise. So you will see that your castle is still inside of the dialysis membrane or the, your sample holders. And that's the main purpose. Yeah. So maybe Allah can chime in. I agree with the comment made by Dr. Park. Um, uh, to, I'm not sure if, uh, if she mentioned that, but um, the math balance should be measured for all sampling time point, not just uh, one or two of them. Thank you for the comments. Um, uh, for the next question, I think this question is for uh, Dr. Uh, Kapana. Uh, Pangdil. Further, uh, can you please further elaborate uh, on the safe space mentioned in your presentation? Oh, well, um, safe space is actually a range of uh, um, the release rates within which, um, you know, um, the variants uh, of the formulation or the manufacturing process changes, all batches are bioequivalent to each other and to the RLD or to the target product. So um, uh, this type of safe space can be like, you know, developed um, from any um, batches that has like, you know, um, um, different release rates and also in vivo data where they show that they are bioequivalent to each other. So during the product development, this type of studies can be done or if you have data from the, you know, product development phases, initial phases, where like, you know, a small changes in 
uh, or changes in formulation variables or process parameters. And you also have the different drug release profiles or drug release profiles of these batches and the in vivo data. Then with that, you can set a range, uh, you know, uh, of the highest and lowest um, release rates within which these batches are um, equivalent to each other, bioequivalent. So this provides, uh, um, you know, it, it, it provides a lot of regulatory flexibility and helpful for the um, post-approval changes also. In that case, like uh, one does not have to do um, in vivo studies again. So this is very helpful for setting uh, clinical relevant uh, dissolution, I mean, release acceptance criteria, as well as for the regulatory flexibility in handling any type of changes, you know, post-approval. Thank you for, for addressing this question. Um, for the next question, uh, what are the considerations for accelerated dissolution release methods? Uh, how can the accelerated study be uh, extrapolated to the real-time study? I can go briefly um, because I presented this accelerated versus real-time method for the intravaginal rings. Um, so at this time, we do not have any standard like, you know, um, set up for how to extrapolate uh, the accelerated to um, real-time. Uh, but we, we expect that some type of relationship should be established linear correlation, maybe when the mechanism of action is not changed, or even if the mechanism of action is like, you know, with high temperature, for example, the release rate is higher, or some mechanism of, uh, of release is changed also, some type of relation should be established there. So at this time, we do not have any specific, and it also depends on what type of um, methods you will be using for accelerated uh, test. So um, this will be all review issue. So submit as much of the data as much possible. And if you have data from, I mean, try to submit the data from both, uh, you know, um, uh, this B batch, uh, bio batch and all other exhibit uh, batches uh, using both the methods. So we can also access like, you know, if, um, if like mechanical action has changed or there is some type of relationship established. So at this time, we do not have any specific recommendation for uh, using like, you know, what type of methods or how to extrapolate from accelerated to real time. Yeah, I can chime in here. So we've done quite a lot of this with um, various different uh, dosage forms. And we do try to always do an in vitro real time test even if this is going on for five years so that we can get a correlation with um, uh, between the accelerated and the real-time data. And particularly, we're looking to make sure that there isn't any change in the mechanism of release when we're accelerating. And so even if you have even just a portion of your real-time data, maybe you don't have, if it's a very long release, you might not have everything yet, but you can see if in, say, in the early stages, if the release profile it, it look is looking really different like you've got a burst release or, or your burst release is gone with your accelerated method you can't see it anymore so there's this things like that that you can look at initially and if you find that for example if you should have a burst release and you don't see it anymore then you realize that you've changed the mechanism your release your accelerated method is probably too fast so a rule of thumb is would be to slow down your acceleration because if you have something that's going on for years and if you end up with a, a, a accelerated method that may be a month or two, that's still great compared to years. So it's just relatively speaking, you know, the longer it is, yeah, the longer your accelerated test is likely going to have to be to be representative. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Um, yeah, we, we got another question for you. Um, um, for the PLJ microsphere, could you uh, suggest which is the most influent um, parameters for IVRT sameness among many? I think um, this question, they raise uh, several param uh, parameters, including 
solvent level, particle size, crystallinity, and drug distribution, as well as surfactant, etc. Yeah, these are all very important. One that we found is particularly important is porosity. So, and the solvent can contribute to that. So which solvent system you're using in the manufacturing, you can have more or less porosity or different types of porosity. And you will typically find that that, that porosity, you know, the more porous it is, then as a rule of thumb, then it's going to be faster um, release profile because the porosity allows the aqueous phase to imbibe both in vitro and in vivo and start that process of degradation of the PLG and also to solubilize the drug and help to bring it out. So that is a key one. I mean, also the, obviously the polymer that you're using, you know, the molecular weight, the end cap, you know, all the, everything to do about the polymer characteristics are, are very, very important. Um, yeah, so all of, all of the above, but, but one I would say to watch out for is, is the porosity. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Yeah, uh, the, the study you just mentioned um, has, has been published or maybe we can... With, with microsphere process. Yeah, we published quite a lot in the last um, couple of years. Um, quite a bit of it is in the Journal of Controlled Release, I think also in the International Journal of Pharmaceutics. But if you search, you know, the last couple of years under particularly those two journals and my name, you should be able to find that. Thank you. Um, we got another question. Um, did apparatus two with enhancer cell show less variability than the in-house methods? Uh, which one of the method do you recommend? Um, so between our enhancer cell, yeah, the variability was kind of similar. Maybe ours was a little bit less, but the, the issue there was how we'd actually, we didn't have a good manufacturing to make our actual cells. So I think that once we have that down, our method would definitely be better because the biggest problem there is that screw cap that tears and, and wrinkles the membrane and our method doesn't, you know, uh, you know, make sure that that doesn't happen. But where we were getting variability was from the poorer um, actual ma making of the cells and we are addressing that right now. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Um, uh, we got another question. Um, uh, is it acceptable to use accelerated uh, IVRT for sustained release formulation? Uh, what supporting document should be provided for regulatory support? Just you want me to address that one or? Yeah, I, I mean, this is a new question we, we received. Okay. So it was again on the accelerated method. So yes, I think that accelerated methods should be acceptable, but I think that's a more of an FDA question. I, I know that, um, yeah, and it's the, what we've said before to get a correlation or a relationship with the real-time method and all the supporting documents I would imagine are that relationship with the real time and as much as understanding that you haven't changed the mechanism of release and um, having sufficient other, uh, other formulations that have differences that you can show that discriminability over several other formulations and that you've got not just the, first of all the same rank order of release, but but also maybe a, you know a good um, if you can also an IVIBC with that. But but yeah, so I think part of that question is really more the regulatory aspect, which I'm only um, I can't address fully, but can just make suggestions. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Burgess. Yeah, maybe I can add some of my uh, perspective. Yeah, so usually for, for some of the product, right, if the intended use is for like many years, um, uh, I think using accelerated um, 
uh, IVRT uh, is still very valuable. So in some of the product specific guidance, you, you will see that um, if you uh, want to uh, use uh, accelerated IVRT, uh, it's highly recommend uh, the applicant to, uh, uh, to, 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 to contact to FDA um, through uh, control correspondences or pre meetings to discuss your accelerated uh, IVRT methods. Um, yeah, I think th this is all the questions we re received this morning. Um, I, I think some of the questions are from audience are because they are more related to the afternoon session. So uh, those questions uh, has been directed <coughs> to other session uh, for panel discussion. Uh, uh, they will be addressed in the afternoon session. Um, uh, here, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, our panelist uh, uh, discussion and thank you for pro providing your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, we will have a one hour lunch break and uh, we will uh, uh, start the afternoon session at uh, one o'clock. Thank you, everyone.